turn to the Gospel of John, chapter number 15. The Gospel of John, chapter 15, a familiar passage perhaps, and I preached on it several times in my ministry here. This is the, the uh, illustration Jesus gives here of the vine and the branches, and a very important thing to understand that God expects out of all of us as Christians. Let's begin reading in verse 1. Jesus speaking, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. We'll stop reading there. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you here this morning, and we are so thankful for the privilege of being able to be here in your house today. We know that many are not able to meet today, not meeting, but we're thankful we're here and call for your protection upon all of us. But as we come to the preaching of your word and a very important subject for all of us, I pray the Holy Spirit of God will take your word and apply it to each of our hearts today. And that as he does, we'll not just be hearers of the word, but as James tells us, we'll be doers of the word. We need to see how you want to see fruit in our lives. And it ought to be our concern today that we do bring forth fruit. So use me today in this service. Speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you got anything out of what I just read in John 15, you'll see that Jesus wants us to bring forth fruit in our lives. It's very important to him. If we are not bringing forth fruit, I hope you caught verse 2, we're like a dead branch. All it's good for is to be thrown in the fire and be burnt up. How sad. The Lord doesn't want to see that in our lives. He wants us to bring forth fruit. But the first thing I want you to notice about bringing forth fruit is what we'd call a union that's necessary. Verse 2. Every branch in me. Notice there, in me. Branches need to be connected to the vine to bring forth fruit. They get their sap, they get their life. All they need to bring forth fruit on that branch comes through the vine. So Jesus is saying, just like a grapevine, and just like a branch having to be attached to the vine to bring forth grapes, you have to be attached to me to bring forth any fruit in your life. What does that mean? We've got to be sure that Jesus Christ is in our lives. He's not automatically there. We have to do something in order to have Jesus move into our lives and we know what that is. We must accept him as our Savior. The Bible says in, in John 1, 12, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. We call that experience being born again. And Jesus plainly said in John 3, 7, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And in John chapter 3, he explains what being born again is. He says, being born of the flesh, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the spirit is spirit. You had a fleshly birth. We celebrated today Joe Rollins' 91st birthday. She was born into this world fleshly 91 years ago. Jesus is saying, it's great to have a fleshly birth or you wouldn't be here. 
But secondly, you need a spiritual birth. You need a time and a place in your life when you are born spiritually. How does it happen? John chapter 3 tells us further down, the famous verse John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The key there then is to be born again, you've got to believe in Jesus. What does that mean? Believe Jesus existed? Certainly. Believe that Jesus was a historical figure years ago? Certainly. But you don't stop there. What it takes is believing in what Jesus Christ has done for you. We have a problem, don't we? We have a problem called sin. And God cannot stand sin. As I've said in this pulpit so many times, he cast Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden for one sin. They were 99.9% .9 perfect, which none of us are, but they were 99.9% .9 perfect. Never told a lie, never committed murder, never hated anybody, absolutely never did all the sins we think are so bad, none of them. All that Adam and Eve did was disobey God and eat of one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and sin came into their lives, and God couldn't stand them. He had to kick them out of the Garden of Eden. But God loved them, and he provided a way to accept them again through shedding the blood of animals and clothing them in coats of skins. A picture of what was going to happen thousands of years later when Jesus Christ would come into this world, go to that old rugged cross, take all of our sins upon him on that cross, and pay for them shedding his precious blood. He washes our sins away, and then he offers us his righteousness. So being born again means you realize you're a sinner, you can't save yourself. In God's eyes, you're bad, not good. In God's eyes, you deserve eternal punishment. But you realize Jesus took your punishment for you. He paid for all of your sins. And so what you need to do is repent of your sins and receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. That's a decision you make at a moment of time. And it's a decision that is being born again. And that's what it takes to be in the vine, Jesus Christ. If we are not in him, we can't bring forth any fruit. Because without me, he said in verse 5 here of our text, ye can do nothing. So many people think, oh, if I live a good life and give to charities and I'm nice to everybody and say nice things, boy, if I live a good life, God's going to accept me. Sorry. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. So you got to have Jesus if you're going to heaven. You've got to be in the vine, Jesus Christ. And when you're in him, when that union takes place, then you have the possibility of bringing forth fruit. Well, what kind of fruit? What is fruit in the New Testament God wants to see out of our lives? Well, right in our text chapter, John chapter 15, you'll notice verse 16. Here's the start of it. It says, ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. What would be the first fruit of a Christian? Another Christian. In other words, the Lord wants to see us witness for him, tell other people about him so they can be saved. You see, Christianity is a big circle that's gone on for 2,000 years. A person gets saved, gets into church baptized and discipled, then they go and win somebody else. If that wheel stops somewhere, 
and we didn't win people, and people didn't get baptized and, say, and, and part of the church, then people wouldn't be saved at all in. We've got to keep that wheel going all of the time. And so it's very important for us to be a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at Romans chapter 1 and verse number 13 at what the Apostle Paul says about winning other people being fruit to your account. He said here, Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I proposed to come unto you, but was let hitherto, that I might have some fruit among you also, even among other Gentiles. Here he refers to winning Gentiles to the Lord as fruit. So that's the first fruit the Lord would like to see in our life. Next fruit. In the book of Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22 and 23 it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. So the second kind of fruit God would like to see in our lives is the fruit of the Spirit. Now you say, how do you get that? When you trust Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, the Holy Spirit of God moves into your life. When He's there, He's going to prompt you and help you to produce the fruit that God wants to have in your life. We can't love like God wants without his help. You say, how do you know that? Romans 5, 5 says, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. So without the Holy Spirit, you couldn't experience the love of God. Without the Holy Spirit, you couldn't teach others the love of God. The Holy Spirit's the one that produces that and all the other fruit in your life. And daily we ought to be concerned. Dear Holy Spirit, help me today to be joyful. That's what God wants, to rejoice no matter what the situation. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. So in light of all this coronavirus everywhere, don't get downhearted and discouraged and all upset. Rejoice in the Lord. God knew it was coming. God knows all about it. God knows if you're going to get it. God knows what's going to happen to you if you do. You're in his hand, Christian. Rejoice no matter what. Don't let the devil rob us of our joy at any time. You know, we have to remember God's with us. If the Lord lets you get the coronavirus and you die, guess what? Paul said to die is gain. To be with Christ is far better. You're going to a better place than being here. Sooner or later, something's going to get you anyway. It's going to happen. So, boy, to know Christ and know where you're going ought to cause joy in your heart at all times. The Holy Spirit wants to produce that joy. Then, of course, all the other fruits of the Spirit that I'm not going into today, that's something God wants to see. Over in Philippians 1.11, it mentions another fruit that God's looking for. The fruit of righteousness. What's that mean? Well, as a Christian, God wants you to live the right kind of life, to do the things he wants you to do. God gives us lists in the Bible. I don't have time to go into detail about it, but let's look at one of those lists here this morning while we're looking at lists. Colossians. Go to the book of Colossians, if you will, and notice what it says in chapter 3. In chapter number 3, look what it says in verse 12. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and, whoo, here's a biggie, forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity or agape love, which is the bond of perfectness. There's righteousness. There's a fruit of righteousness God wants to see in our lives. One of those fruit of righteousness is forgiving other people. Boy, the amount of Christians that get bitterness in their heart and can't stand somebody in this life. That's a shame. What if Jesus Christ got bitter towards you and couldn't stand you? You wouldn't have any hope. 
but he doesn't. He loves you and forgives you if you're his child. He won't cast you off. Wonderful to know that. But we need to be that way towards others. Fruit of righteousness. Another fruit, Hebrews 13, 15. There is the fruit of our lips giving thanks unto the Lord. Another fruit you can produce for the Lord Jesus Christ is being thankful. You ought to be thankful all day long. Be thankful you have the health and strength to get up in the morning. Be thankful that you have a job. Be thankful that you have a family. Be thankful you have a house to live in. Be thankful you have a car. Be thankful every day that God's with you every step of the way. Thankful, thankful, thankful. Every time you eat a meal, sit down and thank God for the food. It's wonderful that he provides it for you to have. Being a thankful person really helps you in life. And it's a fruit the Lord's looking for. He likes to see people who thank him all the time. Do you like to be thanked when you do something for somebody? Of course you do. It's kind of, kind of sad if you give somebody a gift and... They never say thank you or send you a thank you card or anything. It's just gone. Kind of think, well, it sure wasn't very thoughtful. And even thank me for that that I did, you know. That might just slip their mind for some reason. I mean, things happen like that. But it doesn't hit you right, does it, when somebody doesn't thank you? Well, it doesn't hit the Lord very well when you don't thank him. Remember the ten lepers that Jesus cleansed? Man, I am sure in their hearts they were thankful Jesus cleansed them of leprosy. Horrible disease. Worse than cancer. No cure. You look forward to dying when you're a leper and you had to be cast out of your home and out of your town and go live in a leper colony while all parts of your body start falling off. Leprosy just ate away. Be horrible, horrible. To be cleansed from that was, whoo hallelujah, right? However, those ten lepers left all rejoicing. Only one came back to thank Jesus. And he said very sadly, I thought there were ten that I cleansed. Where are the other nine? Now, I don't know if that statistic might tell us where people are today about thanking him, but do you think only one out of ten Christians may be faithful in thanking the Lord like they should? I hope it's a better percentage than that. But the Lord says, a fruit you can give me, a fruit I want to hear is thanking me, thanking me, thanking me. Become a thankful person. It's another fruit given to us in Romans 15, 28. And that's the fruit of giving to needs of others. Paul talks about fruit there when that church gave and helped other people. So there's the fruit of giving by helping others. God's looking for people to be helped in physical ways. When you help people financially, maybe help people with food, maybe help people fix something, something you do to help other people, that's a fruit that God is looking for. So I wanted to mention these fruits that are in the New Testament. I'm not saying this is a complete list of the things we can do for the Lord might be fruit. But God wants us to be in Jesus and bringing forth fruit. And not just fruit, uh, some fruit, but look at verse number 2 back in John 15. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purchaseth it, that it might bring forth more fruit. God wants fruit. God wants more fruit. And then, if you will, let's go on and notice something else. In verse number five, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. The Lord wants fruit. The longer you live for him as a Christian, there ought to be more fruit. And finally, boy, we ought to be winding up our lives with much fruit. That's what the Lord would like to see in our lives as Christians, fruit. Is there fruit? Or is there more fruit now than you used to bear? Is there much fruit in your life as a Christian? Well, just evaluate all those fruits I went through. How are you bearing them? There ought to be fruit being born in your life every single day. 
It's really a matter of how you're living for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I want you to notice something. To bring forth fruit, verse number two mentions the Lord does something to us, which is important in the physical realm of grapevines. Look at verse two. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it. Or the idea is prunes that branch, that it can bring forth more fruit. If you're familiar with trees, fruit trees and all that, my understanding is so that they can bring forth the amount of fruit, you got to get rid of a lot of excess branches on there. Because too much energy is going to all those branches. You cut them back, cut off a lot of those little branches on the tree, then the fruit's going to be better on the big branches. That's what he's talking about here. In order for you to bring forth all the fruit God wants you to have, he's got to do some pruning in your life. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means, number one, that God has to get your attention and so sometimes he has to give you what the Bible says is tests. The Lord tests all of us, James chapter 1 says. Those tests might be in a lot of different ways. God might test your faith in him by having an accident occur. God might test your faith in him by some big financial problem hitting you. God might test your faith in him through an illness. God uses a lot of different tests to see how you are going to react and try to give you stronger faith. You know, folk, when everything's just going along smoothly, it is so easy to forget God. Now, I guarantee you, in this coronavirus scare going around the world, there is 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, maybe 100 times more prayer than there was before it started. Everybody's thinking of God in a prayer now because there's a serious thing going around. Why weren't they doing that all along the way? Back in the Gulf War, 1991, the war we had with Iraq. Man, when we first bombed Baghdad and everybody could see it on TV, the weeks after that, attendance went up in churches everywhere across the country because we weren't sure how things were going to go. So people flocked to church. and They're concerned about the situation. But just as soon as things die down and things are prosperous again and everything's going well, People forget the Lord. Isn't that sad? Do we need him in the good times as well as the bad times? You better believe it. And God sends those bad times along to see if people will increase their faith in him. And it's a test for us. Anything that happens in your personal life, God's trying to test you and prune you so you can be a stronger Christian for him. The Apostle Paul went through that. Now he seemed to be a guy of great faith already. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, God wanted to teach him another lesson. Prune him a little bit. And he gave him some kind of thorn in the flesh, which the great Apostle Paul prayed three times to God for God to take it away, and God would not do it. So it was a little upsetting to him, but God said this. Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. Here it is. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Paul, when you have a physical infirmity, infirmity you have to deal with, when you have a problem physically and can't minister the way you think you ought to, guess what? That's when my power is going to be greater. And I will never, ever in my life forget a preacher who had a terrible disease. I don't recall what it was, but he had to be under oxygen constantly and couldn't hardly walk. He pastored a church in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And I heard him speak at a pastor's conference. 
They helped him into the pulpit. He had his oxygen tank before they had a lot of other things you can use today. He had an oxygen tank right there by him so he could be under oxygen and he had to hold on to the pulpit to stand there. He spoke, wasn't real vibrant, exciting, running around or anything like that. Just had to talk the way he had to preach. But I'll never forget. So I pastored a church in Philadelphia for years. God blessed, then I got sick. Things weren't going too good. I thought I was going to have to resign. Told the church I just couldn't do the things that I used to do. I could still speak if they wanted me to. And they said, Pastor, we want you to keep on. We're going to get busy working for the Lord. So he said, you know what? When I went under that oxygen and all I could do was just preach on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday, that's all I could do. I couldn't visit, couldn't do anything else for the church. All I could do is preach. God tripled the size of our church in those days. And he said, you know what? I found out it's not me. It's all about God. When I couldn't do anything but trust him and preach his word, God blessed. And so, folk, the Lord has to prune us to bring forth more fruit. And he has things happen to us so that we understand, hmm, it's not us. We've got to trust him. Without me, you can do nothing. We've got to have the power of the Lord upon us or God can't bless us. So, he has to prune us. Now, also in that pruning process may have to be some chastening. Notice what God wants us to realize in verse 3. You are clean through the word which I've spoken unto you. God wants us to be clean in our lives as Christians. Now, of course, that comes, as he says here, through the word of God. If you don't know what the word of God says you shouldn't do, and you don't know what the word of God says you should do, then how can you be clean? So he says you're clean through the word. You need to read it and study it and see the things God says don't do. See the things he says to do so that you can be clean in him. Now, if we're Christians and we're truly saved and we're not doing what we should to get us to be clean and do the things God wants us to, he sometimes has to chasten us chasten us. And of course, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter number 12 that the Lord chastens every son he receives. That is Hebrews 12, 6. And he says, if you don't have chastening, then you're not a child of the Lord. Read that, Hebrews chapter number 12. So the chastening of the Lord is something else that he does in our life to try to get us to bring forth fruit. What is cha how does chastening work? Is there a phone back there ringing? Anybody tell where it is? It just keeps going. Nobody here has a phone? Okay, well, maybe it stopped fine. <laughs> Beginning to notice ring, ring, ring going on back there. Or something going on. All right, but chastening starts this way. First thing the Lord tries to do with us in chastening is convict our heart. You'll be convicted about something you're doing or not doing. Then you have a choice. When that conviction comes, you can either say, Lord, help me today. I'm stopping doing that thing I shouldn't do. Lord, help me today to start doing the thing you're speaking in my heart to do. We have that choice with the conviction. But if we don't listen to the conviction... God has to go a little bit further. It's just like you chastening your own children. Maybe the first time they do something wrong, you just talk to them. But the next time they do something wrong, you have to move on to a time out. If it's something else that becomes bigger, something bigger in the punishment. You know how you have to do it as a parent. God does that as our father. He starts with conviction that he might have to touch us in some way. He may, as the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 30, make us weak. Some kind of weakness comes along. Financially, uh, perhaps something happens with regards to our vehicles. We've got to pay out big money to repair them or the house or whatever. Something causes us to be weak. 
or he sends sickness along. We get sick. Boy, most people get sick, pray. Ring, 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 ring. Pastor Gritton, could you please pray for this? And I'm happy to receive it. Don't think I'm, I'm criticizing that at all. Please call me. I'm happy to pray for the things that go on. When people go in the hospital, you know, I'm glad to be able to run up there. I'm glad that I was called right away about Judy Taylor so I could get up there and see her when she first had her fall. So I'm glad to hear those things. But honestly and truthfully, you know, we're concerned when it happens. God's trying to get our attention. And so we need to take a look. Well, is there something that I'm not doing that God's spoken to me about? I still haven't done it. I better get busy now. See, he tries to chasten us to get us where we ought to be. And that's the purpose when you're chasing your own children. To try to get them to do what's right. You want them to grow up and, and be something in this life. And not just a mess. Children left to themselves bring their mothers, mothers to shame, Proverbs says. You don't want to be shamed by your children, so you have to discipline them along the way. God does that for us. And his purpose in that is all coming back to this fact of bringing forth fruit. He wants to see fruit in our lives. Another part of bringing forth fruit he mentions here is also found in verse number 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Prayers involved when it comes to the matter of bringing forth fruit. God wants us to ask him for his help. Do you ask God for help in your daily life with the things that you need to do? You know, Philippians chapter number uh, uh, 4 and verse number 13 says, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. The Lord wants to help you with all of your tasks. I usually tell the young people the first day of school here, God wants to help you with your schoolwork. Do you ever pray and ask him to help you? I learned that when I was way back in school. I wasn't some type of brilliant person, but I did make A's simply because I worked hard. I worked hard. But guess what I learned to do? Ask the Lord to help me. First of all, help me to learn that geometry. Help me to understand it and learn it. Then when it came to test time, help me to review and remember it for the test. And when I take the test, Lord, bring back to my mind the things I've studied. Do you know that's real? God wants to help you if you ask him. That doesn't mean, Lord, I didn't get to study last night, so please help me. God says to study. He's not going to help you unless you do your part. You've got to do your part. But see, that's part of asking the Lord for things. You have some need in your life today in the financial realm. You have some need in your life today when it comes to relationships with people, work, school, whatever. Do you have some need then ask. You know, James said in James 4, 2, you have not because you ask not. We just forget to ask the Lord for his help. And boy, does he want to help you bring forth fruit. So here's something in our lesson today to ask the Lord to do. Bring forth fruit in your life. My message today, are you bringing forth fruit. God wants to see it in our lives. He's a fruit inspector. Did you ever read Matthew as we close here this morning, chapter number six, seven, excuse me, Matthew chapter seven. It's about fruit. Some things here about fruit. Notice what he says here in verse number 15 to 20. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. There it is. You'll know a false prophet by their fruits. Read on. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? No, they don't grow on those kind of trees. Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth 
evil fruit. No, that's an interesting statement. I didn't talk about that. But you can be producing evil fruit in your life. Things that aren't right. And the Lord doesn't want to see that there. Verse 18, a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast the fire. Sounds like John 15 there, doesn't it? But look at verse 20. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. Here's the final thought. The fruits you produce in your life really give evidence to whether or not you're really a child of God. Are there any fruits there? To just pray and receive Christ as Savior, or say you receive Christ as Savior and then your life doesn't change and you go on the same old way, that's not Bible salvation. Remember 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation, creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things, A-L-L, all things, all things, all things, not some things, all things become new. So a Christian's life ought to be changing and fruits ought to be there and it ought to be evident by their fruit ye shall know them. So today I'm trying to help you. God is the big fruit inspector. He knows what's going on in your life. Are you producing fruit? Are you, having been saved years, producing more fruit? As you come to the end of your life, senior saints, have you produced much fruit in your life? Evaluate yourself. God is, and he's looking for fruit in our lives today. Let's bow our heads together. Heavenly Father, what an important subject today, this matter of bearing fruit. You expect every Christian to bring forth fruit. If we don't, we're like a dead branch that needs to be cast away and destroyed. Lord, definitely you're not going to absolutely cast us into hell if we're your child, but we do not deserve to have any blessings from you. We deserve only to be taken out of this life and meet you empty-handed. How sad that would be. Lord, definitely we ought to be bringing forth fruit. We've tried to encourage folk today with that need. First of all, we can't bring forth fruit unless we're saved, unless we've been born again. Maybe we've been church members all of our life. Maybe we've been a good person as we look at it all of our life. Maybe we've been baptized, but unless we have union with Jesus Christ and he is in our life, we are not saved. We are not a part of your family. We can't produce any fruit to our account. So the first thing we need to check up is make sure we are saved. If we are saved today, then certainly you want us to bring forth fruit. And we've talked about the fruits in Scripture we can bring forth. May all of us evaluate our lives as to whether or not we're bringing forth fruit. And Lord, convict us where we need to be bringing forth more fruit. And may we, by the power of the Holy Spirit of God, start doing it in our lives. Have your will and way in this invitation hymn as we sing it this morning. Anyone here that doesn't know you as Savior, anyone here that needs to come and pray for needs in their life, I pray they will. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand to our feet. If you need a psalm book, turn to page number 319. We'll sing a couple of stanzas of Just As I Am. If you're here today and not sure that you are saved, how we encourage you to come. We'd like